Hey folks, thanks for joining us tonight. We're gonna just give it a few minutes to let, let folks join and, and get logged on. So uh, we'll get started here in, in just a couple minutes. Maybe just one more announcement before we uh, officially kick this thing off. We will be recording tonight's presentation. We want to make sure we capture the, the questions and comments that we receive from you all. So just a heads up that we, we are recording this. I think we'll probably also make it available on our website and it will definitely find its way to our, our YouTube channel. Okay, well, it looks like the numbers have leveled off a little bit. So um, let's go ahead and kick this off. Um, good evening, everybody. Thanks, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. My name is Kelly Cunningham. I'm the, the director of the FISH program. And with me here tonight are key members of our team, and including Director Seusman. Um, you're likely here tonight because you've got a vested interest in, in Puget Sound, Chinook, either, either from that you know, that conservation lens or a fisheries lens or most likely from, from both. And as, as you're likely aware, the co-managers recently transmitted the Puget Sound Chinook Harvest Management Plan to, to NOAA Fisheries for, for their review. In case you, you weren't aware, this has been a multi-year effort, including a final push that's occurred over the, about the last nine months. And that push was facilitated by, the, by some federal mediators. And tonight, our goal is to provide you uh, with some information about the plan, uh, why it was needed, and uh, primarily what it contains in terms of some, some key elements. Kyle Addix, who is our intergovernmental salmon manager, will be providing the presentation and then we'll transition to any questions or comments that you may have but maybe just to take a minute before I turn it over to Kyle I want to acknowledge the fact that Kyle and his team including our fisheries modeling unit our, our regional staff and the director's office uh, put in many many long hours getting us where we are today it, it, it wasn't easy and the work was done in addition to their their day jobs um, and I just want to acknowledge that you may not like or agree with everything that's in the plan, but I hope you can appreciate the work that went into it and the balance it strikes for both conservation and fisheries in light of the, the status of our ESA listed uh, Puget Sound Chinook. So with that, um, I'll uh, pump the brakes here. I'll turn it over to Kyle and uh, we'll get started. Kyle, go ahead. Thanks, Kelly. Um, and thanks to everyone for taking the time to tune in at dinner time on a um, Wednesday evening. I've got a, a fairly lengthy presentation I'm gonna go through. There's a lot of ground to cover. Um, wasn't sure who all would be in the audience tonight or what their background was in um, fishery management or the, the history of Puget Sound Chinook. Um, but I'll get through the presentation and then we'll have some time at the end to, to take comments and hear questions from, from those of you in the audience. So just an overview of what I'm going to walk through. I'm going to start talking a little about the status of Puget Sound Chinook salmon. I'm going to give some background on salmon management and the framework of salmon management, some background on the Endangered Species Act listing of Puget Sound Chinook and how we've gotten ESA coverage for our fisheries in the past. I'll talk about the goal and importance of this harvest management plan, some of the challenges we faced, faced with the development of a long-term management plan, and then spend a, a good amount of time on key elements of the new plan and then wrap up with a little bit on what's next, what happens from here and, and a summary of everything I've talked about. So starting out talking about the, the status of 
Puget Sound Chinook salmon. This is a graphic from the 2020 State of the Salmon Report, and it just categorized different sa um, salmon ESUs around the state by their relative status. And as you can see on the left side here, Puget Sound Chinook are in the in crisis state. They've been listed for over 20 years now, but we have not made a lot of progress in seeing the, the increased abundances and things we want to see to move to recovery. Last September, the department put out a, a document we called the scoping document. Um, this is the cover, cover page from that. It was a document on Puget Sound Chinook salmon. It has a lot of information on the status of individual management units and populations and, and a lot of good background information. And I'm going to reference this from time to time as I move, move through the presentation, but, but more on this later. As I said, it has a lot of lot of detailed information on individual populations of Puget Sound Chinook. These are just three graphs I grabbed um, from that document showing the long-term natural origin escapement trends for Skycomish, Puyallup, and North Fork Nooksack Chinook. And you can see from each of these, they highlight the period, the 10 years or so after ESA listing in gray and that the average abundance there. And then some more recent time periods from 2010 to 2016, the time leading up to the, the previous draft of an RMP prepared by the co-managers. And then the most recent years that um, we've seen since that 2017 draft and led up to the, the 2022 version. There are two major stressors to Chinook populations across Puget Sound. Habitat degradation is a huge one from um, forest, past forestry practices, um, development, urbanization, channelization of streams, um, loss of estuaries. All of those factors are depressing Puget Sound Chinook salmon. And we overlay climate change on that. And it just exas exacerbates the problems that are created by that habitat um, degradation. And both of these are really affecting the productivity and survival of, survival of Puget Sound Chinook. We've got to have improved protection of habitat and acceleration of our restoration efforts if we're going to reverse the trend and get Puget Sound Chinook out of this crisis status they're currently in. Um, this plan is really about fisheries and fishery limitations cannot rebuild Chinook runs without habitat actions, but we do have to make sure that fisheries are managed carefully to, to ensure that we do make progress on recovery as habitats restored moving forward. Chapters um, four and five of the scoping document have a lot of information both on, on the stressors facing Puget Sound Chinook and the Puget Sound Recovery Plan. So I encourage you, if you haven't looked at that document um, and you're interested in, in these topics, focus in on those chapters. So salmon um, don't really follow legal boundaries. They have complex migratory behaviors. Um, as Puget Sound Chinook leave the freshwater areas and Puget Sound in, into the marine waters, they soon cross over the international boundary into Canada, out into the ocean, across the boundary into federal waters, and some stocks all the way up the coast, um, back into U.S. waters in southeast Alaska. As we plan and manage our, our fisheries, we have to consider the effects of the fisheries not just in Puget Sound, but in all of those marine waters crossing those multiple legal boundaries. As I said, the migration um, patterns for Chinook are really complex and they vary within stocks in Puget Sound. Um, most of the information we have on salmon migrations are actually come from fisheries, coated wire tags placed in juvenile salmon. Those salmon are then caught in other areas and we can look at those tags and figure out where those fish came from. More recently, genetic sampling is being used as a tool to do that. But this is another, um, chart from the scoping document, and it just compares four, four Puget Sound Chinook populations. And starting with the Nooksack on the left, um, these fish are heavily um, caught in northern fisheries. So you can see the, the dark brown and the sort of peach colored bars are the Southeast Alaska and Canadian fisheries. Much smaller portions of this stock are caught in, in southern U.S. fisheries, in the Pacific Fishery Management Council fisheries in the ocean, and in Puget Sound fisheries. And you move across this um, bar, and you can see the variability in, in where these fish are caught, moving all the way over to the White River, where a much smaller percentage, down below 30%, are caught in fisheries in Canada and Alaska. 
small portion in Pacific Fishery Management Council fisheries in the ocean, and the majority of the fishery mortality is in Puget Sound fisheries. So this is important as we as we try to develop a resource management plan. We have to understand where the fish are being impacted and what we can do with the fisheries we have control of. The management happens in a number of different forums for salmon, particularly Chinook salmon. Um, there's an international forum, the Pacific Salmon Treaty formed the Pacific Salmon Commission. I'll talk a little more about this, but it's involved in management of fisheries from Southeast Alaska down to the, the coast of Oregon. The Pacific Fishery Management Council is the federal entity that's responsible for management of fisheries in ocean waters off the west coast of the southern United States. And then we have the, the USD Washington and USD Oregon um, case areas where WDFW works with our tribal co-managers on fisheries in these areas. Again, some background on the Pacific Salmon Treaty. It first went into place back in 1985 and it's been modified and renewed several times since then. And it established the Pacific Salmon Commission. And the, the goal of the commission was to conserve the Pacific salmon in order to achieve optimum production and to divide the harvest so that each country reaps the benefits of, in, of its investment in salmon management. The treaty includes chapters on management in specific areas. Um, the Fraser River area is one example where the treaty includes a chapter on management of um, sockeye and pink salmon returning to the Fraser River in British Columbia. And it also um, has chapters on specific species on a broader scale and of most relevance to, to the um, Puget Sound Chinook Harvest Management Plan is that chapter three covers Chinook salmon management that migrate throughout the treaty area. A little more on the, the PST Chinook chapter. The chapter sets allowable catch levels of Chinook in Southeast Alaska and British Columbia ocean fisheries. And those are determined annually using science-based predictions of the numbers of fish returning coupled with allowable fishing rates specified in the treaty. The 2009 to 2018 update to the agreement reduced allowable catch in Alaska and British Columbia from previous versions. And most recently, um, a new chapter went into place in 2019 that remains in place through 2028. And it includes additional provisions to reduce fishing pressure on stocks of concern while still providing harvest opportunity for more abundant stocks. Additional harvest reductions of up to 15% in Oregon and Washington relative to fishing rates in 2009 to 2015 of 12.5% in British Columbia relative to those same years and 7.5% in Southeast Alaska are being implemented depending on Chinook salmon abundance. Moving down to the coast of Washington and Oregon and California, the Pacific Fishery Management Council oversees fisheries in those areas. It's one of the regional fishery councils that were established by the Magnus and Stevens Fishery Conservation Act of um, 1976. And it's responsible for managing fisheries in the exclusive economic zone from three to 200 miles off the Pacific coast of Washington, Oregon, and California. The council does not just manage salmon fisheries, they manage a long list of other marine fish and fisheries, um, but they do have a Pacific Fishery Coast Salmon Management Plan that is specific to salmon. And it establishes conservation criteria, harvest controls, fishery objectives, and allocation frameworks for fisheries in federal waters. The salmon seasons for ocean waters are planned annually during the March and April meetings of the, of the council. Moving to, our, to what we call our North of Falcon process. It's a planning process that runs concurrently with the Pacific Fishery Management Council process was started as a move towards cooperative state tribal management in the mid 1980s. And during that process, WDFW works with tribal co-managers and constituents to plan inside fisheries that meet conservation objectives for each stock when linked with PST and PFMC fisheries. Um, within the USV Washington case area, that includes tribes on Puget Sound, Strait of Juan de Fuca and Washington coast, and on the Columbia River, the USV Oregon case area. Moving to a little background on the ESA listing and, and ESA coverage for fisheries. Puget Sound Chinook were listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act in March of 1999. And this is just a quote from the Federal Register listing at that time. It said that historically high harvest rates in ocean and Puget Sound fisheries were likely to be a significant source of risk in the past. 
Dems is hope, hopeful that recently established lower harvest targets for Puget Sound stocks will reduce threats to the persistence of the ESU due to reductions in direct mortality in size selective fisheries. So there was the acknowledgement there that um, harvest rates had been high on Puget Sound Chinook in the past. They had been reduced as um, abundances fell, as productivity fell um, in the 1990s and leading up to that listing. A little more than a year after listing, NEMPS issued the Salmon ES, ESA 4D rule that established take prohibitions. It provided limits on applications of ESA take prohibitions for plans and activities meeting the rules criteria. And that included a limit, limit six, that was for joint tribal state resource management plans or RMPs developed under USB Washington and USB Oregon. There's a list of criteria in the 4D rule for what, the, what an RMP needed to include. It needed to define populations, to utilize viable and critical population thresholds, to set escapement objectives or maximum exploitation rates, to display a biologically based rationale. It needed to include effective monitoring and evaluation programs, to, pro to provide for evaluating the monitoring data, provide for effective enforcement and education, include restrictions on resident and anadromous species fisheries, and finally, to be consistent with plans and conditions established within any federal court proceeding with continuing jurisdiction over tribal harvest allocations. We need to have federal ESA authorization for Puget Sound fisheries due to their take of listed Puget Sound Chinook. With that, without that authorization, we, we cannot move forward with fisheries. The Puget Sound co-manager submitted long-term resource management plans under limit six of the 4D rule to cover fishery years from 2004 to 2009 and from 2010 to 2013. As the, um, we, as the 2010 to 13 plan approached the end of its life, the, the co-managers did want to um, submit another long-term RMP, but didn't for, for several reasons. So since 2014, our ESA authorizations have occurred through annual consultations on co-manager fishery plans through the Bureau of, of Indian Affairs. One of the main reasons a, a long-term RMP was put off initially was we were engaged in an update of our fishery regulation and assessment model base period. Um, FRAM or the fishery regulation assessment model is our tool for planning and evaluating fisheries to make sure that they're staying within their exploitation rate ceilings. We were in the process of updating the data used to, to model fisheries from very old code of wire tag data from back in the 70s and early 80s to more contemporary data um, from the 2010 teens. So we had to complete that process before we could really move forward with, with another long-term plan. And there have been um, subsequent revisions to the model since the, the update of that base period that have delayed us a little further. We did submit a plan in 2017, just after we um, completed that initial model update. It was deemed not sufficient for NIMPS for evaluation. Um, they needed more information for how the plan met each of the criteria that I outlined on the previous slide. And we've been through two rounds of mediation um, getting to this new plan, one in federal court and most recently with the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service. A lot of complex issues to work through um, and went into mediation twice to, to get through them and get to an RMP submission. I'm gonna um, move on now to talk about the goal and, and the importance of the harvest management plan. This is the goal statement from the plan and it is to ensure that fishery related mortality will not impede rebuilding of natural Puget Sound Chinook salmon populations consistent with the capacity of properly functioning habitat to levels that will sustain fisheries, enable ecological functions, and are consistent with treaty reserve fishing rights. So um, key there is that the fisheries cannot impede that rebuilding. They, they can't rebuild the populations alone, but they, um, they can't impede rebuilding as habitat improves. The RMP is a harvest management plan. It's not a habitat restoration plan, a hatchery plan, or recovery plans. Those, those plans are other places, but this RMP is about harvest management. And the question as we develop the plan isn't whether past harvest actions had done a good job or, or not of contributing to salmon conservation. 
The question is, considering the status of both listed Chinook and Southern resident killer whales, to what degree can we continue to impact Puget Sound Chinook via harvest of other salmon stocks? Once the RMP is authorized, it would provide ESA coverage for Puget Sound fisheries for their effects on Puget Sound Chinook, as well as for other listed animals potentially affected by those fisheries, including Southern resident killer whales, Puget Sound steelhead and listed rockfish. Having a multi-year RMP approved by NIMPS will have many benefits, including reducing annual workload associated with obtaining ESA coverage and reducing the annual uncertainty and the status of ESA coverage. The long-term plan establishes certainty and management objectives, our exploitation rate limits and escapement targets for the annual planning of co-manager fisheries that will meet ESA requirements and not impede conservation and recovery of Puget Sound Chinook. And while the RMP addresses ESA requirements and sets conservation objectives for a 10-year period, fisheries will still be developed on an annual basis through the pre-season planning process. I'm going to um, shift now to, to some of the challenges with development of a long-term RMP. I opened up with talking about the, the status of Puget Sound Chinook. The Puget Sound Chinook stocks have continued to decline since the time of listing. A lot of stocks are now chronically um, hovering at low abundances. A longer-term plan is inherently riskier than an annual plan. Um, with an annual plan, we have a little more certainty on what the abundance of fish returning in the next year will be. We know what's happened in the, in the recent years. As we move eight, nine, 10 years down the road, there's more uncertainty with, with what the abundances might be. Um, listed Southern resident killer whales, need Chinook is a source of food and Southern resident killer whales have declined in abundance over the last 20 years. Completing a co-manager plan required reaching agreement with 17 tribes on management objectives for 15 management units and 22 populations of Chinook. So the complexity of the plan with all of those individual populations with individual um, differences in, in productivity, differences in migrations, dealing with um, 17 um, individual tribal entities that all have their own interest and their um, their views on roles of harvest and other things in salmon recovery. It, it's a big task just to get to agreement with, with that many tribes on this complex an issue. I mentioned that um, we were in mediation and as did Kelly leading up to the completion of this plan. The plan was developed through a federal mediation process with WDW and 17 tribes. The agreement that initiated that mediation required the parties maintain confidentiality consistent with state and federal laws. So as a, as a way to engage the public while we develop the plan, we released the scoping document that I mentioned earlier, the public comment draft of the Puget Sound Chinook salmon document that presented a broad background on current status and stressors for Puget Sound Chinook on the department's authority, on co-management with the tribes, the Puget Sound recovery plan, coastwide and Puget Sound fishery management, and detailed data on each of the Chinook management units and populations within Puget Sound. In that document, we asked the public for their assistance in reviewing the document and providing suggestions and comments by posing three specific questions. Those were, are we missing important information? Are there errors in the information that we have summarized? And are there new approaches to management of recreational and non-treaty commercial fisheries that WDFW should consider as we develop and implement the long-term fishery plan? And we received over 500 comments on the draft and they covered a wide range of potential actions to rebuild Puget Sound Chinook. A lot of them did focus on um, approaches to management of recreational and non-treaty commercial fisheries. And we were able to, to consider that as we developed the RMP with the tribes. Our plan is to finalize this document and include responses to public comment in the future. So I'm going to move now to, to the actual resource management plan. This is the title page from the document. It's actually called Comprehensive Management Plan for Puget Sound Chinook Harvest Management Component. And it was submitted on February 17th of this year to National Marine Fisheries Service for their evaluation. 
It's a 400 page document. It's available on our website. I'm sure some of you have, have, have at least browsed through it. It's, it's a complex document that addresses the federal requirements for a resource management plan. And I'm gonna walk through it, um, not in terrible detail, but I'm gonna kind of focus on the fishery limits that are set for each management unit around Puget Sound. Again, not knowing who would be in the audience tonight or what kind of background they have in fishery management, I thought it was important to, to just go through a, a brief list of terms. There are things that fish biologists and fishery managers use on a daily basis. And we often assume that everybody else knows what they mean, but I thought it'd be helpful just to, to walk through some of those and explain the definitions um, before I get into the details. Starting with escapement, Escapement is just the number of adults returning to the spawning ground. So um, after all the fisheries have happened, after all the predation and natural mortality has happened, it's the number of fish returning to the spawning grounds. It could also be the number of fish returning to a hatchery. Exploitation rate, or ER for short, is the proportion of the population remo removed by fishing in a year. Just a very simplistic example, if there were 10 fish in a population swimming around in the marine waters and one of them got caught in the marine waters. One of them, one of them got caught as they returned to freshwater and eight escaped. Um, that would be two out of the 10 were removed by fishing. So that would be a 20% exploitation rate. Exploitation rate ceiling is the maximum allowable exploitation rate for the year. So as we plan fisheries for each population, we have a limit on the exploitation rate and we have to plan our fisheries to stay below that ceiling. And then we do postseason evaluation to see how we did relative to the preseason plan. Low abundance threshold is a critically low escapement value. When we are projecting escapement numbers below this value, they trigger lower limits on exploitation rate ceilings during fishery planning. A critical exploitation rate ceiling is the maximum allowable exploitation rate when a stock is at low abundance. So if we see a, a low abundance, we trigger this more conservative exploitation rate ceiling or a critical exploitation rate ceiling. Terminal is a term we use a lot um, in I've had several presentations where I, at the end I realized people did not know what it meant. But when we talk about terminal fisheries, there are fisheries in freshwater or marine waters in the immediate vicinity of a river mouth where the catch is almost exclusively comprised of populations returning to that watershed. And the opposite of terminal is pre-terminal. So these are fisheries that happen in mixed stock marine waters away from the terminal areas and before the fish um, start to sort themselves out as they return to their individual rivers. Southern United States or SUS is just a term we use to refer to fisheries and waters south of the US-Canada border. PTSUS are pre-terminal fisheries and waters south of the US-Canada border. And I already mentioned FRAM. FRAM is our fishery regulation and assessment model that's used for planning and evaluation of all of our fisheries. So hopefully for those of you that don't um, live fish and fish management um, every day, that, that's helpful setting, setting you up for some of what I'm gonna go through in the individual management units. Um, so just some more, some broad and key elements of the new RMP. There are changes to allowable exploitation rates for many management units from past plans. The majority of those changes were due to updates to FRAM and corresponding ERS exploitation rate estimates and updates of stock assessment data and productivity estimates for, most, for the most recent years. It's important to note that these numeric changes to, to allowable exploitation rates are not apples to apples comparisons because of the changes to the fishery model. Higher numeric rates do not necessarily equate to increased fishing opportunity or fewer fish returning to the spawning grounds. I mentioned the, the new chapter, new Chinook chapter of the Pacific Salmon Treaty. Fisheries in the Southern United, United States have new management obligations for some management units that arose as part of that chapter that we had to consider during plan development. And the plan was submitted to be a 10 year plan to cover fisheries from May of 2023 through April of 2033. This is just a map of um, Puget Sound with the Chinook populations in each watershed numbered. Um, 
these populations, some of them are grouped into management units where there are multiple populations within a watershed. Other watersheds, there's just a single population, but I'm gonna walk through um, management unit by management unit following the numbering here. So starting up north with the Nooksack River, working my way down into South Puget Sound and then over to Hood Canal in the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Starting with the Nooksack management unit, for many of these, I've grabbed the, a, a long-term um, escapement graph from that scoping document, just to sort of show you what's happened to the population over time. Nooksack's um, north and south fork spring chinook populations are at chronically low abundance due to habitat degradation. There are hatchery conservation programs in place for both the north fork and south fork populations. The majority of the fishery impact is outside of the southern U.S. You'll recall the, the chart I showed earlier, which showed that almost 80% of the fishery impact on Nooksack Chinook are actually in British Columbia and Alaska fisheries. There is a Pacific Salmon Treaty Southern U.S. exploitation rate limit. This the, the average of the 2009 to 2015 exploitation rate. The Pacific Salmon Commission uses a different model to estimate fishery impact, but is if we assess um, that same time period with FRAM, that was roughly a 7% exploitation rate. The management unit continues to be managed at a critical exploitation rate ceiling associated with minimal fisheries in the southern U.S. This is a stock that does not have any higher allowable exploitation rate for southern U.S. fisheries. We've just acknowledged that it's it's in critical status. It's likely to remain in critical status for the turn of the RMP. So we have low exploitation rates um, associated with that. And that rate is 10.9% in the Southern US. That rate can be increased up to 14.1% and one out of every five years. Moving south to the Skagit Summer Fall Management Unit. This is numerically the most abundant management unit in Puget Sound. It's comprised of the upper Skagit, lower Skagit, and lower Sock populations. Similar to the Nooksack, the majority of the harvest impact is from fisheries outside of the Southern US. The, it also has a Pacific Salmon Treaty Southern US ER limit. And again, that's 21% um, as assessed by FRAM. The exploitation rate ceiling for all fisheries is 52%. The low abundance threshold for the population is 7,844, and that's equivalent to the maximum sustained yield escapement estimate based on the most recent um, spawn and recruit data. The critical exploitation rate ceiling is 15% for Southern US in even years and 17% Southern US in odd years. So if we see escapements that fall down below that low abundance threshold, um, we would manage these critical rates for the Skagit summer fall population. Moving still within the Skagit basin, the Skagit also has a spring Chinook management unit, and it's comprised of the Cascade, Upper Sauk, and Suiatl populations. Again, the more majority of harvest impact is from fisheries outside of the southern U.S., the Pacific Salmon Treaty Southern US ER limit is 11% as assessed by FRAM. The exploitation rate ceiling is 36% for all fisheries. The low abundance threshold is 1,024. And again, that's the maximum sustained yield escapement estimate. And the critical exploitation rate ceiling is 10.7% in Southern US. I, as I explained the, um, the Pacific Salmon Treaty Southern US ER limits, I should have mentioned that those are limits that apply if a population is not meeting our bilaterally agreed escapement goals. So we have goals for the Skagit populations, the Skagit management units, summer, fall, and spring um, that we need to meet. If we're not meeting those escapement goals, then we need to restrain harvest to that 11% is assessed by FRAM. And that's what the 10.7% critical exploitation rate ceiling represents. This is just a summary table from the RMP of the objectives for the Skagit Chinook MUs. Again, these are the 36% and 52% exploitation rate ceilings I mentioned the low abundance thresholds of 1,024 and 7,844, 
and the critical rates that are um, employed if we fall below those low abundance thresholds. There are also um, point of instability numbers identified in the plan. These are numbers that where if a statement falls below, there may be significant genetic or demographic risk. They're, they are the lowest observed escapements that have led to the management unit replacing itself in the, in the past. If we fall to those levels, it would, it would um, trigger responses to further limit Southern US fisheries to try to rebuild the stock and develop a, to develop rebuilding plans as well. Moving south to the Stillaguamish management unit, the North Fork and South Fork populations are both at low abundance due to habitat problems, including degradation of floodplain and riparian processes and the loss of much of the estuary. You can see from the, the graph on the right with the escapement trend over time, um, escapement has actually fallen since the time of listing um, for the Stillaguamish management unit. Hatchery conservation programs are in place for both of the populations. This is one of the units that's received the most focus during RMP develop, development, both in 2017 and since then due to the poor stock status. Again, the majority of harvest on the Stillaguamish management unit is in Northern fisheries. And the Southern United States Pacific Salmon Treaty obligation is 100% of that 09 to 15 average, which is 9% as assessed by FRAM. So the new RMP includes Southern US exploitation rate ceilings for natural origin and conservation hatchery origin fish that vary by abundance tier. It includes a commitment to intense sampling and monitoring for freshwater fisheries and Puget Sound marine fisheries that impacts the Laguamish Chinook. And it has a conservation payback concept to ensure that management imprecision, imprecision does not impede rebuilding. And this is a concept that that's identified in the plan and we'll be working further to, to refine. But the idea here is that each year as we plan pre-season fisheries, we have an expected impact on Stillaguamish Chinook. And as we look over the suite of, of non-treaty fisheries and treaty fisheries in Puget Sound, we'll assess whether we exceed our planned impact and if we do, then we would there would be a payback to escapement in the following year. So we would reduce um, we would reduce the non-treaty fishery if it was a, the non suite of non-treaty fisheries that led to the overage, same for treaty fisheries, but there'd be a reduction in the following year to, to try to escape more fish um, to make up for that management imprecision. The exploitation rate limit on adipose mark conservation hatchery origin fish has been the subject of much controversy um, since it was first included in the 2017 RMP. But that limit is really reflective of the importance of the hatchery conservation program to spawning escapement, particularly at low abundances. The, the Stillaguamish population would be in even worse shape without these programs. Escapement of these conservation program fish are important to maintaining the population and are, are really what's helping us keep fisheries going in, in face of the, the poor, poor status of the stock. We've got a lot of gotten a lot of questions since 2017 about why we don't use a different mark for these fish so that they would not be caught in mark selective fisheries. And there really aren't any other viable options because of um, we use these as an indicator for tracking harvest impacts through all fisheries. In the southern US, we electronically sample catch for coated wire tags, regardless of whether fish are adipose marked. But in some northern fisheries, the fish are not sampled for tags unless there is an adipose mark present. So we need to continue the adipose marking to ensure we can track the fishery impact on, on these um, fish throughout all fisheries, north and south of the border. This is just the table from, from the RMP with the management unit, um, the management objectives for Stillaguamish. And again, there, there are three tiers here. If abundance is above 1500, there'll be a 13% exploitation rate limit on natural origin fish and no constraint on the conservation origin, conservation program origin fish. If abundance is between 900 and 1500, there'll be a 9% NOR exploitation rate, and that 9% matches the, the Pacific Salmon Treaty obligation for Southern US fisheries. And there'll be a 14% exploitation rate limit on the hatchery origin fish. 
Um, but if the abundance falls below nine, below 900, there'll be additional fishery actions considered to further reduce the impact below the levels of the 9% and 14%. Moving to the Snohomish management unit, it's comprised of the Skykomish and Snoqualmie populations, both of which have shown downward tr trends since the mid 2000s zeros. Fish passage barriers, increases in impervious surfaces and corresponding changes to, changes to stream flow and loss of 80 plus percent of the estuary have reduced productivity of both populations. This is another unit where the majority of the fishery impact is outside of the Southern United States. And it, another stock that does have an obligation under the new PST chapter 8% Southern US exploitation rate limit as assessed by FRAM. 2019, we saw a record low escapement um, for Snohomish Chinook, and that was a, a subject of particular concern during RMP development and led to a, a conservative approach for Snohomish Chinook. Again, at the bottom of the page are the, the abundance thresholds and exploitation rate ceilings from the RMP. Um, when abundance is above the upper management threshold, the Southern US exploitation rate limit will be 10.3%. If we fall below the upper management threshold, but above the low abundance threshold, 9.3% will be the limit. And if we fall below the low abundance threshold, but above the lower bound threshold, 8.3% Southern US will be the limit. If we were to fall below the, the lower bound threshold, there would be additional Southern US harvest, me harvest measures considered to try to rebuild the population back up to higher abundances quickly. Moving down into, into central Puget Sound, I'm gonna lump three of the management units here. The Lake Washington Green and Puyallup management units are all modeled together in our FRAM through pre-terminal fisheries. So their management objectives are linked in the RMP. At higher abundances, manage, management objectives will include a pre-terminal Southern US exploitation rate ceiling of 14% that will allow for planning of pre-terminal and terminal fisheries, which in combination will result in spawning escapements that meet or exceed MSY escapement for each population. At even higher abundances for green and Puyallup, that pre-terminal Southern US exploitation rate would increase to 15%, and there could be corresponding increases to terminal fisheries while still meeting the MSY escapement. At lower abundances for any of the management units, um, and we have an, a, a different term in for these called the middle management threshold, but if we're at abundances at the middle management threshold hold or low abundance threshold, Southern US exploitation rate ceilings that are more restrictive to pre-terminal and terminal fisheries take effect. And the terminal fisheries for each of these MUs are contingent on data collected in season and potential updates to expected run size based on those data. So we have the ability in these watersheds during the season to, to assess whether the run is returning as expected, better than expected, or worse than expected, and make adjustments to terminal fisheries to make sure that, we're, that we hit our management objectives. This is the, the table from the RMP. Um, it's essentially the identical table for all three of these management objectives. And as I said, we have these upper management thresholds. If all three of these units are at abundances above these thresholds, there's a 14% pre-terminal Southern US exploitation rate limit and terminal fisheries are planned to hit the escapement targets for each watershed. If the green and Puyallup are at these higher abundances, there's a slight increase to 15% in the pre-terminal Southern US ceiling and terminal fisheries can expand slightly. If, if abundances fall below um, the upper management threshold into this middle management threshold, their Southern US exploitation rate ceilings for the co combined terminal and pre-terminal fisheries, 18% for Lake Washington and Green, 30% for Puyallup. And if we fall to, down below these low abundance thresholds, more restrictive Southern US rates of 12% um, for Lake Washington and Green, 15% for Puyallup River. Just to put the 14% the pre-terminal Southern US rate um, limit in perspective, we haven't seen a rate higher than 14% in our fisheries in over the past 20 or so years.
there are some specific actions identified in the Puyallup Management Unit Profile. Um, those include development of a joint annual monitoring and enforcement plan each year, commitment to continue to address and improve fishery enforcement and compliance on the Puyallup and carbon, particularly during times of Chinook return. In 2021, we initiated some creel, sam creel sampling to make sure that we're adequately uh, assessing the impact of the recreational fishery in the Puyallup. It's a very popular fishery, very close to the, the Tacoma, Seattle core population area. So um, important to, to make sure that we're adequately assessing the impact of the fishery. There, we committed to continuing that creel work from 2022 to 2027. And as a conservative approach, while that creel data is collected in the coming years, the recreational fishery will be limited to four days per week during August and September, the peak of the Chinook migration. Another uh, management unit actually within the Puyallup Basin is the White River Spring Management Unit. It's a genetically unique early time population. This stock was brought back from the verge of extirpation through hatchery conservation programs initiated back in the 1970s. And White River Springs have really been affected by habitat degradation and upstream and downstream fish passage through Mud Mountain Dam and the Buckley Diversion Dam and Lake Taps project. Improvements to the Mud Mountain Dam fish passage are expected to improve survival, survival and result in shifts in capacity and productivity of this population in the future. The management objectives in the RMP are a Southern US exploitation rate ceiling of 22%, a low abundance threshold of 400, and a critical exploitation rate ceiling of 15% Southern US should the um, abundance be projected below the low abundance threshold. Moving into Deep South Sound and the Nisqually Management Unit, the historic population in the Nisqually was extirpated due to habitat loss, historic high harvest rates, and hatchery introductions. Exploitation rates have been reduced on, on the extant population in the Nisqually, and extensive habitat protection and restoration efforts have and are occurring. The population is currently in colonization phase, meaning that their management actions designed to increase natural spawning abundance. The exploitation rate ceiling for the Nisqually unit is 47%. The low abundance threshold is 6,300 total system escapement, and that's designed to meet hatchery broodstock needs as well as um, have 3,500 natural spawners in the watershed. And the critical exploitation rate is a 50% reduction to the allowable Southern US exploitation rate ceiling. So if we um, were projecting abundance below 6,300, we would reduce Southern US fisheries by up to 50% to try to hit that um, 6,300 goal. Jumping over to Hood Canal and the Skokomish Management Unit. Again, in the Skokomish, the historic populations have been extirpated due to habitat degradation and loss, high harvest rates, and extensive hatchery production. The co-managers are, co are implementing strategies to attempt to reestablish a locally adapted population of Chinook. And it's kind of a two-pronged strategy. One is the reintroduction of spring Chinook to the watershed that's occurred in recent years. And the other is an experimental selection of later returning Chinook from the extant summer fall return. And while those things go on, um, we are stabilizing the extent population while local adapt adaptation strategies are ena enacted. The exploitation rate ceiling on the extant summer fall population is 50%. There's a low abundance threshold of 1300 natural origin plus hatchery origin returns. And there's a critical exploitation rate ceiling of 12% for pre-terminal Southern US fisheries with additional reductions to fisheries in Hood Canal and, and the Skokomish River should we fall below that abundance. And there are additional fishery measures identified in the plan to enable spring and late returning summer fall Chinook to pass through fisheries while focusing harvest on the peak of early and normal time George, Adam hatchery, George Adams hatchery returns. Moving up the canal to the Mid-Hood Canal Management Unit, the Mid-Hood Canal Unit's shown little sign of viability since listing, and there's, there have been questions about its historic status as an independent population since the time of listing. 
This unit's made up of returns to three separate streams in, in Hood Canal, the Hama Hama, the Dosi Wallops, and the Duckabush. Um, it's the only unit where three, um, three independent streams, three independent marine tributaries were lumped to, to make a management unit. So it's, it's, there have been questions since the time of listing about whether it truly was an independent and viable population in the past. There was a hatchery conservation program initiated in the mid 1990s. It was terminated after 20 years as it, it had shown no increase in natural origin recruits to the system. The co-managers initiated a project in 2020 to assess current habitat and the likelihood that watersheds have sufficient capacity and productivity to sustain a Chinook population. So in the, in the new RMP, um, the message was conveyed that the co-managers do not believe there is an independent or viable population of Chinook in Midhood Canal. There are no exploitation rate ceilings as were used in past plans in the new plan. Um, fisheries obviously will still be limited by the exploitation rates on all of the other um, management units around Puget Sound, but there is no exploitation rate ceiling specified for Midhood Canal. The plan commits to not expand fisheries in North Hood Canal for the life of the RMP or until NIMPS determines that the fishery management constraints on Mid Hood Canal are no longer necessary. It limits fisheries during preseason planning to a minimal reduction in the number of projected spawners that will not change the status of the population and will have a neg negligible effect on the survival or recovery of spawning aggregations. So we would um, compare essentially in our preseason plan what our planned fisheries looked like compared to a plan that had all Puget Sound fisheries closed. And we would show a minimal reduction in the number of spawners with those fisheries. And finally, the plan asked the um, National Marine Fishery Service to reevaluate the role of the current Midhood Canal population and the recovery of the Puget Sound Chinook ESU. Moving um, out of the canal under the Strait of Juan de Fuca and the Dungeness management unit. Um, the early time Chinook population in the Dungeness has been at critically low abundance for decades. Agricultural water withdrawal, shoreline bank armoring, riparian clearing and sediment impacts and flood floodplain loss are key factors to the depressed status. And there have been hatchery conservation programs in place that have been key to maintaining the population over the past decades. Like the, the Northern Puget Sound stocks and the Strait of Juan de Fuca stocks, the majority of fishery impact is outside of the Southern US. And we have um, exploitation rate ceilings associated with minimal um, Southern US fisheries in place, 10% Southern US exploitation rate ceiling for Dungeness, a low abundance threshold of 500 and a critical exploitation rate of 6% Southern US should abundance fall below that low abundance threshold. Moving west in the Strait of Juan de Fuca to the Elwha, um, as most of you are probably aware, salmon utilization in the Elwha Basin was combined to the lower 4.9 miles of the river for over 100 years. Um, the dams were removed starting about 2012, and we're expecting natural production of Chinook to increase with potential to be one of the largest Chinook runs in the Puget Sound ESU, but it's likely to be volatile as the watershed adjusts post dam removal. There's been a fishing moratorium in place in the Elwha since 2011, just before the start of dam removal. And again, the majority of the fishery impact on Elwha Chinook is in fisheries outside of the Southern US. And we have minimal exploitation rate ceilings um, of 10% Southern US for the Elwha unit, a low abundance threshold of 2000. This was, this was an increased value from past plans as we start to see um, the Chinook population expand post dam removal and a critical exploitation rate ceiling of 6% Southern US should we fall below that low abundance threshold. So that covers the management units that are in the plan, a little bit about what's next. NIMPS is beginning their evaluation and administrative processes, which could take up to 18 months. They have some pretty extensive um, ESA requirements as they do with their review of the plan. Um, that NIMPS process will provide some additional opportunities for public input as they um, publish things in the federal register for comment. 
The co-managers are planning to use the RMP framework for fishery planning during the North of Falcon process this year. The plan um, was proposed to, to take effect with 2023 fisheries, but we're using the same framework as we plan 2022 fisheries. And that means that an annual consultation process will be, be needed again for ESA coverage for 2022. I mentioned the WDFW scoping document. We'll be working to, to finalize that document and respond to the comments received during the comment period. Uh, the RMP, if you haven't seen it, is available on the, R, on the WDFW website um, at this address. Um, encourage you to take a look and look through at least the, the management units that are of interest to you. Just to summarize um, everything I've gone through, Puget Sound Chinook salmon remain in crisis status. Improved protection of habitat and acceleration of restoration efforts are essential to getting Puget Sound Chinook out of this crisis status. And we must plan and manage fisheries conservatively to ensure we do make progress on recovery as habitat improves in the future. We have to consider the impacts of fisheries in British Columbia and Alaska as we plan Southern US fisheries. And we have to manage Southern US fisheries consistent with the Pacific Salmon Treaty limits for those um, management units that have limits. We have to have federal ESA authorization to conduct Puget Sound fisheries. The co-managers have completed a 400 page plan to address the complex 4D rule requirements for a resource management plan and submitted it to NIMPS earlier this month. And completion and submission of that RMP was an important step forward for Puget Sound fishery management, and it will ensure that harvest management continues to support efforts to recover Puget Sound Chinook salmon over the next decade. So again, thanks to everyone for their interest in, and for tuning in to, to listen to me go through some pretty complex stuff, um, a lot of information and, and try to make it understandable for people. Um, I can uh, pass it back off to Kelly for a minute and we can try to take answer questions and take comments. Yeah, thanks Kyle. Uh, nice job, no easy task trying to boil down a, a 400 page document and all the complexity associated with uh, these fisheries and, and, and the, the, uh, the management framework. So nice job. Um, Leah, before we go to questions, it might be worthwhile giving folks some instructions about how to raise their hand in Zoom and and that type of thing. And you've been doing this for us for a while. So rather than me stumbling and bumbling through it, I'm hoping you'll be uh, be a champ and, and uh, provide that direction to folks and you can dive into the Q&A piece. Yeah, no problem. So we have kept folks muted during the beginning of the program, but now that we are in the question and answer period, if, if and when you have questions, feel free to raise your hand. Um, you can use that pressing the raise hand feature on your screen. Um, or you can do it by pressing um, star nine on your cell phones or phones if you're calling in. You can also unmute yourself by pressing star six. I will prompt you to unmute yourself as well. Um, and if you have any technical issues during the call, use the chat button at the bottom of the screen and we will help you out. Um, I think that covers about everything. I think the first person that we heard from was Randy had some questions in the chat and I let him know that I would call on him to answer his questions live. Um, yeah, thanks, Leah. Before, be Randy, before we go to your question, just want to um, mention that we're scheduled to be here until 730. I want to be respectful of people's time. I understand that um, your lives, unlike ours, don't revolve around fisheries management and things like uh, resource management plans. So we will be ending at at uh, 7.30, and with that, uh, Randy, go ahead. You might, you might need to unmute yourself, Randy. Looks like you're still muted. Randy, we might have sprung this on you, might not be ready, so we can circle back to you. Um, next up, raised hand is Andrew. Andrew, I have allowed you to unmute. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this was a really informative um, Zoom call, so I appreciate the rundown on the management plan. Um, I had two questions. The first was uh, regarding the management units. Um, uh, based on the on the management unit map, uh, which this is the first time I've, I've seen it, I haven't 
gone into the 400 page document and reviewed it, but um, it looks like typically the management unit maps uh, boundaries kind of match our central Puget Sound um, marine areas, except for Marine Area 9, which looks like it's split between uh, a management unit to the north and to the south. First question is, I was wondering how that in the management units split their impacts are salmon season. The second question is regarding um, in-river protection for wild Puget Sound Chinook. Um, here in our local river, Snoqualmie, we have a constant parade of river floaters. In fact, we have companies that um, rent inner tubes and shuttle people up from the base of Snoqualmie Falls to Fall City where they take out. And from basically dawn to dusk throughout the summer through September, there's a constant parade of floaters. And um, my question is, is WDFW um, monitoring or researching the impacts of that against Wild Chinook? And does WDFW have any management tools to protect Wild Chinook during that time in river? So thanks, Andrew. Um, the the first part of your question, I'm I'm looking back at the map. I hadn't really thought of sort of the um, the population group boundaries in Puget Sound and how they necessarily overlay with our um, with our catch management areas. I mean, Area Nine is one that is right there. It's sort of the intersection of of a number of those um, of those population groups with the um, just because of its geographic location, kind of spanning Hood Canal to South Sound to the um, the Whidbey Basin. Um, as far as what that means for management, when, when we're planning fisheries, we're we're basing our our anticipated impact of the fishery on the code of wire tag recovery data that's been recovered over many years. So it's it's considering um, the the complex group of stocks that's migrating through the area during particular times of year. Um, don't know if that really gets at your question, but um, hopefully so. Um, this the second part, um, I guess, is really about whether WDFW has is is studying the the potential impact of recreational uh, activities like tubing on Chinook. I I don't know that we are. It's a concern we hear in certain watersheds at certain times of year. You know, Chinook are returning when it's it's still hot and people are still out there floating around rivers, but I, I don't know that we have anything actively going on to, to assess that impact. And I don't know that we have any, any real authority to do anything about that kind of activity. Um, others jump in if, if, if you have heard of anything we're doing or, or have other ideas. Yeah, well, uh, uh, this is Jim Scott, Department of Fish and Wildlife. I'll uh, jump in there um, on the tubing question. It, it is a uh, uh, significant concern during the summer months, as uh, you uh, pointed out, WDFW does not uh, have the authority to control that action. And, uh, but we are aware of a number of times that uh, county governments have been contacted and on some occasions they have, uh, particularly during severe drought years, um, taken actions to uh, reduce that potential impact. So we're aware of it. Uh, we don't have the authority, at least I'm aware of, uh, but county governments uh, have stepped up sometimes uh, to help us with that. Okay, and next question is from Robert. Robert, I have allowed you to unmute. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, um, I was curious about um, black mouth management, especially since they're smaller. Um, I imagine not very good at orca food. And uh, is there any, any call to uh, think about changing how how that part of the population is managed. You want me to take that one, Kyle? Sure, Mark. Uh, thanks for that, Bob. I, uh, 
I'm not sure how much uh, you paid attention, but we've uh, we've had to make some significant reductions uh, in winter fishing opportunity here in the recent past. So I would offer that um, uh, as we've moved forward in time, um, you know, we have a really limited amount of Chinook impacts that we can use to be able to prosecute fisheries throughout Puget Sound. And as we've moved through uh, the last several North of Falcon processes, um, uh, through that public engagement, uh, the majority of anglers that we hear from uh, seem to prioritize summer fisheries over those winter opportunities. So I would offer that we've actually have changed our management in the recent past, uh, primarily just listening to the to our constituents and and listening to the desires for for more targeted summer opportunity at adults. Um, We've also, uh, over a long period of time, we've significantly reduced our yearling programs. Um, so there's really only a small handful of those to contribute to the overall diversity of those hatchery populations within the sound. Um, but, but in general, um, we, we haven't really directed our management at those black moth fisheries uh, in a significant way in the recent past. Thanks. And next we have a Galaxy phone. I have request you to unmute. Hi, this is Norm Reinhardt. Long time no see, guys. Hey, Norm. How y'all doing? You've been busy. At any rate, Midhood Canal. That's an interesting thing I, I saw there, but I'm not quite sure how to interpret it. Are we saying we no longer have to use the, the, the constraining numbers that we've had in the past from Midhood Canal? Number one. Number two, we won't be able to fish there for a while unless National Marine Fisheries approves the RMP. Am I getting the correct interpretation there? For the most part, Norm. So so we've submitted this this plan to NIMPS. They have to go through their evaluation process. The, the, the plan hasn't been approved. What we have proposed is that we will not have a, an exploitation rate ceiling on Mid Hood Canal anymore. That um, essentially the, the exploitation rate ceilings for all the other stocks around Puget Sound will still limit marine mm -hmm. fishery and we, we won't be able to increase that impact with those other limits. And that there's some things that we'll, we'll continue to do. We'll continue to have many of the, the same fishery restrictions in North Hood Canal um, in the immediate future, but we're asking them to reevaluate the role of Mid Hood Canal um, in recovery of the Puget Sound ESU. And if, if things were to change and it was not, it was not an essential to recovery population in the future, some of these other restrictions could go away. But in the interim, um, we're, we're proposing not having an exploitation rate ceiling on that population. We will limit our fishery impact to a very small reduction in the, in the number of spawners in Mid, Mid Hood Canal. And we'll leave some of those um, fishery restrictions we've had in the canal in place just to ensure that we're, we're not having a, a too big of an impact on the fish that are there while this other path of looking at the role in recovery continues. Thank you. Thanks, Norm. And next up, it looks like we have Mark. Mark, you can now unmute. Hi, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. It was really helpful. I appreciate that and your, your time and your the ability to provide some input. I'm a Area 7 fisherman, the San Juan Islands. We had, I think, seven days last year where we could fish for Chinook. In hearing what you're saying, um, and my understanding is that the exploitation rates in the Stille are staying the same, and hearing that the plan will be used for setting the seasons in this coming North of Falcon process, I'm wondering with the payback provision that you talked about, can we expect any kind of an opportunity for fishing for Chinook this year, this coming year? Thanks, Mark. So the, the payback, the conservation pay, payback concept is something 
that would be used moving forward. It's not something we're looking backwards into, into the past. It would be something um, used moving forward. Um, so no, that, that will not affect um, what fisheries look like in 2022. Um, we will have to look at the Area 7 fishery, what happened last summer. Um, we've been try playing catch up on some of, the, some of these fisheries as, as effort has increased and catch rates have been good to, to adequately model, model those preseason. So we're gonna have the normal North of Falcon process where we figure out how many impacts are available and figure out how to best use them around Puget Sound, um, whether that includes Chinook fishing or other fishing in particular areas or particular months, we'll go we'll through that process. Thank you. I'm hearing there might be a little bit of hope for Area 7. Thank you, Mark. And next we have Shannon. Shannon, I have allowed you to unmute. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was wondering where my tools went there. Y'all hear me? I hear you, Shannon. Okay, very good. A uh, couple of questions and a couple of comments. Uh, my first comment was um, has to do with um, the review of the Chinook uh, management plan that uh, uh, Washington, Oregon, California, and DC uh, uh, went over. And the one uh, that was a recent one, uh, Phil Anderson was leading the, the call for the US side. Uh, Jim, uh, Jim was mentioned, but it, I don't think he was there. Um, so when I, uh, what left, what I got, what, what I, that's, I'm st stuttering here. What bothered me about that uh, whole process is when the, the Canadians presented um, how they deal with uh, marked fish, um, those <clears throat> heads would or would not be deposited in a box on the docks on the west side of Vancouver Island. So <clears throat> hearing that, it made me think that um, well, there could be quite a bit of improvement on um, getting that data there. I, I wasn't happy to hear that from our uh, Canadian neighbors. So um, because our, <clears throat> our process is a lot better. You know, we have a uh, real real surveys right on the dock. So, and it's a volunteer basis in Canada. So I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how usable that data is. So then uh, 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 the, other uh, the other comment and question I have is uh, Governor Inslee uh, stated that, um, that 50 million more Chinook would be uh, raised uh, for production, and I, I don't know how that program's going, but uh, how much of that would be um, coming back to Puget Sound? That was in the papers. So thanks, Shannon. Um, and yeah, you're, you're talking about Part, the part of the big um, killer whale initiative and, and part of that was some increased hatchery produ production targeted at making more prey available for southern resident killer whales. I see Jim has his hand up. He might have a better handle on uh, on where that whole process is and, and where that production is. Yeah, thanks, Kyle and, and Shannon. Good to hear from you. Um, so I'll, I'll take your questions in reverse order. Uh, first, in terms of the production, uh, my understanding is the 50 millions are long-term objective. The 20 million is uh, really what we've got in the water currently. And if you uh, looked at kind of the exploitation rate information that Kyle presented earlier, you know, roughly 80% uh, of the adult uh, Chinook salmon would, uh, uh, from that additional 20 million fish, uh, would come back to Washington. So it's, you know, it, it should be a, a good little bump for us. Uh, and then uh, on the uh, Canadian fishery question and their sampling, uh, 
uh, yes, uh, we uh, believe some improvements can be made. Um, we have a number of technical groups who have been making recommendations to the commissioners about uh, improvements in uh, Canadian fishery sampling and monitoring, and also some improvements in the US monitoring. Uh, and uh, with the treaty that came into place in 2019, there's some new funding uh, as well on both sides of the border to make those improvements. Oops. So uh, kind of short answer there is, yep, uh, there's some improvements that can be made in the next few years. Okay, last question, and I'll, I'll leave it to somebody else. Um, uh, I fish here in Bellingham Bay down at Samish. This is my 51st season of fishing in Puget Sound. And our fall, our fall harvest of Chinook um has gone for um it's we almost don't have one and um i sure hope we can improve the fall production to samish and also whatcom creek um it's not what it used to be not anywhere near what it used to be thanks thank you shannon Next, we have Kurt. Evening, gentlemen. Good to see you all. Um, I'm Kurt Kramer, in case you didn't recognize my voice. First, I want to thank you gentlemen and all your staff for the wonderful work you did in getting this project done. It, I'm sure it was a massive lift, and it's greatly appreciated. Um, well done, fellows. I got a big picture question, I guess, in, in I have lots of nitpicking things on the plan, but that's we defer that to the North of Falcon. That's you know that doesn't surprise anybody. But the big question or concern I have is plans like this and the way it rolls out leaves the impression that that Chinook can be recovered or can, contributions contributions can be made to recover Chinooks by how you manage your fisheries. And in rivers like the Stillaguamish and some of our real problem childs, that just isn't true. You know, those, those stocks cannot recover themselves unless there's massive things done outside of the, the harvest age. And, you know, I mean, all the number crunchings I can do on the still Guamish stocks, is it's, it's physically impossible them on anything other than just stellar freshwater marine survivals for them to replace themselves. You got declining fecundities, you got declining freshwater survivals and declining uh, marine survivals and on every survivals you know, a female can't replace herself. And how do you stay in business? You don't. And you have to make, you know, the agency has to expand their message, I believe, let folks know that if we really want Chinooks and Puget Sound, that more than more needs to be done than, than fishing. You know, I, I'm old enough and involved in this long enough to remember in the, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, that the co-managers made concessions in their harvest to buy the habitat time to make meaningful changes in how we manage our habitat and begin recovering this, the Chinooks. 20 years later, you know, we're worse off than before. The, and, you know, the, the harvest piece of it didn't, you know, the, the habitat folks didn't take advantage of that. And unless that message changes, you know, you can have more and more rivers look like the Stillaguam and Chinook. And if you want to make a comment, I'd appreciate it. But have a great evening and thanks. Yeah, maybe I'll just take a quick stab at that and then turn it over to people that know a hell of a lot more than me. But th thanks for the comment, Kurt. I, I think, you know, we want to be really clear. This is not a recovery camp plan. Um, we recognize that, that um, you're not going to recover fish by, by uh, you know, managing fisheries, right? Constraining fisheries. We, we dialed that dial over about as, as, as dialed as you can dial it. Um, so this is, not a, this is not a recovery plan. This is, a, this is a harvest management plan. And the purpose of the plan is to ensure that um, as, we, as we prosecute our fisheries, we're not impacting recovery, you know? So, so just wanna be clear about that and maybe let uh, Kyle or Jim or Mark expand on that. 
No, I, I don't disagree with anything you said, Kurt. And I, I tried to make some of those points uh, up front in the presentation tonight that it's it's habitat issues that ha are depressing these populations, that we can't rebuild them even with, with halting fishing, that a lot of big things have to happen to, to put us on the track to get out of that critical status for Puget Sound Chinook. I mean, I, to me, it's, it's obvious that that message isn't getting to the general public Everybody's looking for somebody else to, to pay the piper to make this happen. And, and traditionally, that's been laid, laid on the fisherman's back. Um, and, you know, the, the habitat has declined. And again, still Guamas is a classic example to the point that, you know, the productivity is just, it just isn't there. And if you can't get that message out in here, then I encourage you know, your collective brain stress, which is very impressive, to figure out ways to get that message to a broader user group in the public. The agency hasn't gotten that message out. And if we're gonna have Chinooks and, and hopefully some Chinook fish, fishing in the future, that message has to get folks. And we either need, need to decide we're gonna recover Chinooks or say to hell with it and we'll get rid of the wild fish and just go hatchery fishing. But we're, in many of these stocks, we've reached that point in my opinion that, that we're, it's time to, to make some really hard choices and enforce that issue. And I'll get off my soapbox now, thanks. Thanks, Kurt. And next we have Bruce. Bruce, I have allowed you to unmute. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I was just wondering, I fish in area seven. And of course the guy said we had seven days, but I think it was six days of king fishing. The question is very simple. Why did not we, why didn't you open up for silver fishing on the outside of San Juan Island this last season? And then you let, in the rivers, they would have the limit of six silvers. That's the question. Did you want me to take that one, Kyle? Sure, I'm actually not sure if I caught the whole thing, Mark, so that'd be great. Well, I think what Bruce is asking is, um, last year in Area 7, we, we did close uh, after we uh, exceeded our, our harvest quota last year by a pretty significant amount. Um, last year also, uh, by exceeding the harvest quota as, as far as we did, um, we did some in-season evaluation of Chinook impacts. And, um, you know, we've talked about that Stillaguamish conservation program with the, the hatchery fish. Uh, we felt like we didn't have uh, the available impacts uh, throughout all of our fisheries, even if we weren't going to just focus on Area 7, um, that, that we had available for us to open any salmon fishing for the rest of the year outside of Bellingham Bay. Uh, Bellingham Bay is actually modeled differently and it has different levels of impacts in it. So the reason why we didn't reopen was because we didn't have the available Chinook impacts to open salmon fishing for the rest of the season. Okay, thank you. But we're looking for silvers out there. No, I, I totally get it. But when you're when you're fishing for silvers, you do hook Chinook every once in a while. Uh, even though you know different places in the water column, you're you still have that opportunity. And we just didn't have those impacts available to be able to open the fishing opportunity back up. Okay. One thing on that now, you know, we released all the Chinooks out there. At least I do. I've been fishing for 55 years out there. I know the reasons. Okay. But you show on television, you know, you have these guided tours like on the Columbia and that, where they show these wonderful guys out there fishing guides. And they're getting uh, wild Chinook. They bring them aboard, net them. Oh, we got this wild Chinook. They grab it, throw it back in the water. You got to teach these guys down there hey, don't take the fish out of the water. It's to de hook the fish in the water. And people see that, and they figure they can do it. It's so Leah, we got time for our, for a couple more, and then we're, we're, we'll need to wrap up. Yep. Next up, we have Alan Chapman. Alan, I have allowed you to unmute. I was going to stay silent, but hearing Kurt, I could do nothing more than uh, support his comments. Uh, the question is realizing that it, harvest is not the problem, where is the department 
uh, moving aggressively with the co-managers in addressing these other issues. It uh, doesn't seem to have done much in the last 20 years. Well, I guess I could, you know, Jim, maybe this is an opportunity for you to talk about the work that we're doing uh, in the still of Guamish. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, and so, Alan, uh, Jim Scott, good to, good to hear from you again, and, and Kurt as well. I see I'm getting a uh, internet connection unstable here, so I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm first, framing it up uh, back to Kurt's statement. Um, I think in one of the early slides uh, that Kyle put up, uh, we spoke to the, the um, fact that uh, fisheries cannot uh, recover these uh, Chinook. You know, it's unfortunate truth. It's not an overfishing uh, problem. Uh, and, but we do need uh, all of your help to get the habitat uh, protection in place that um, protects uh, what's left. Uh, and we need all of your help to work with our legislature uh, and our congressional delegation to get more uh, funding for habitat restoration. And, and uh, certainly uh, we are working our legislature as hard as we can. Uh, we're working our congressional delegation as hard as we can. Uh, and we're making some progress. Um, you know, uh, I think there's a question about the Stillaguamish, uh, for example. Uh, this, uh, through the Pacific Salmon uh, Treaty process. Just last year, we were able to funnel another, I think, $4 million of habitat restoration projects uh, into the Stillaguamish. Uh, so a uh, short message is we're making progress, uh, but really we need all of your help in uh, pushing that rock up the hill uh, and helping us think about how to reach uh, all of the rest of the people in Puget Sound area about how to be more effective. Because, you know, we... Um, we need your help, in short. If I could add just a little bit, there's a difference between uh, what you can do to address situations which might limit Chinook in the habitat, but the identification of the key bottlenecks would seem to be within the expertise of the department and the other co-managers, I would hope, so that we could focus more directly on our knowledge of where the bottlenecks are. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna get pulled uh, off the stage here pretty quick. I bet by Kelly, Kelly and Kelly. Uh, but Ellen, you just served up a, a perfect um, uh, a tennis ball for me. And 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 in a year ago, uh, the director uh, asked us as staff to take a close look at the Stillaguamish uh, as a, a first place to focus in on uh, and identify when. Uh, Schnook are dying, uh, why they're dying to the best of our abilities, uh, and what we can do to, to address that. Uh, so we uh, uh, initiated what we called a uh, Stiligwamish Integrated Conservation Rebuilding Project uh, about a year ago. Uh, it's across all of our uh, programs, enforcement, habitat, wildlife, uh, fish, obviously, uh, public affairs. Uh, we have a team of about 20 folks, uh, and I would, you know, I would say uh, that we are uh, implementing exactly uh, what you have uh, suggested. I'm getting right, right down to it. What specifically uh, do we want to press hardest on on the Stillaguamish uh, in the Stillaguamish Basin? So, so great idea, Alan, uh, and I think we're pushing on it. All right, last one, Leah. Okay, and our next question is a caller. Last three is 739. I've requested you to unmute. So am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes, can we can hear you. hear you. Okay, so I have a couple of questions. The first one is, are we really talking about shorten the days on the water for the sports fishermen? Uh, in all the areas. And, and I'm going to reiterate what they talked about the Stiligwamish. Every sports fisherman out there knows that the Stilly situation is intentional. It's just a way to get us off the water. There's no way they're ever going to improve the return to that river 
if they don't maximize their hatchery levels. I mean, there's, it's just not going to happen, and they should quit clipping their fish. Uh, my, the other question I have is, we keep talking about the low, uh, the low Chinook numbers. Why is it that every marine area last year closed early, up, early because they were all catching too many fish? Doesn't that not make sense? That you're saying the numbers are low, but everybody's catching too many fish, you have to close it early. But like I say, I'm going to reiterate, the stilly situation is intentional. That's just to get us sportsmen off the water. I mean, there's, there's no if, ands, or buts about it. Appreciate those comments. Uh, we're out of time. Kyle, you want to remind us when the when folks will have an opportunity to uh, uh, comment during NOAA's process? I don't know the, the exact timing of, of the entire NOAA process and wh when different things go out for public comment, but we will um, keep our web page updated as, as they walk through their process so that um, and point to point to where documents are and where common opportunities are. I, I, I don't know all those specifics. I don't know that that Noah necessarily knows specific dates and that sort of thing yet. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Kyle. Well, with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Director Seussman for the last word. But just want to thank you all for again taking the time this evening and joining us. And uh, with that, uh, Kelly. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, so. Yeah, my, my main message would be thanks everybody for taking the time tonight. Uh, a lot of heavy material to get through. Thank you, Kyle, for, for carrying the water on that. Uh, did a great job. And uh, thank you for putting your time in here, folks that are willing to come listen to us. I, I can't help but compliment or comment, excuse me, on kind of some of the frustrations out there. Trust me, we're feeling them too. The bottom line is Puget Sound and Chinook are not doing as well as they were when they were listed 20 years ago. Our opportunities are tight. We are trying to make efforts. You heard about the specific efforts in the still Guamish. Uh, we, with our co-managers, are taking on a habitat work plan now as part of North of Falcon, not just looking at fisheries. We understand that we're not going to unfish our way to recovery. These, these plans are meant to make sure we don't interfere with recovery. And it's going to take an effort well beyond our agency, agencies combined. It's going to take the entire state. We've got a lot of people moving in. We've got more people on the way. We got climate working against us, but we, we've tried and the governor made a pretty aggressive move beginning of this legislative session for a salmon recovery effort and it hit a brick wall, at least the policy elements of it did. We had other elements where we were trying to get salmon recovery, salmon biology built into the Growth Management Act. So as we put more people on the landscape, we can put them on, a, on the landscape in a way where it's compatible with improving our salmon runs. That one died this week as well. So I just encourage you all, uh, we agree with you 100%. It's, it's habitat. It's not just harvest. Uh, and we're going to need everybody's help at, at getting that through. And especially it's going to take legislation to do it. Uh, not everybody in the state is passionate about fishing like you all are. And not everybody in the state realizes that their existence on the landscape is what limits that fishing. But with that, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox now. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here. And I want a special uh, thank you and compliment to our staff. This has been a long haul, long nights. Uh, as dense as you think this was, might think this was tonight, it was a thumbnail of what this crew has gone through over the last nine months. And we are in a much better place going into this north of Falcon and, and, and Chinook fishing and Puget Sound in general in the coming decade as a result of that hard work. So look forward to seeing you all at North of Falcon and hopefully out there on the water. That I, I will be quiet now. All right. Thanks, Kelly. Well, that that wraps it up, folks. I hope you have a, a great rest of your evening. And, uh, you know, if, if this is something you want to track, as Kyle mentioned, pay attention to our website. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll try to flag uh, when we see those opportunities for you to, co to comment on the on the RMP during the, uh, the NOAA consultation process. So with that, have a great evening and uh, take care of yourselves. See ya. Thanks, everybody.